Hello, everyone. Okay. Um, well, I say we just get started since I am recording this. Um, if people miss any part, they can go back and rewatch. Um, welcome, everyone, uh, to the first meeting of the Critical Internationalization Studies Network. Um, the plan for this meeting is for, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the network, and then we will have our guest speaker, Dr. Crystal George Mwangi. Am I saying your name right, Crystal? Yes, if you've got it, perfect. <laughs> so my name is Sharon Stein, and I'm an assistant professor of higher education at Idaho State University. And the intention of this network is to bring together scholars, practitioners, students, community organizations that are interested in reimagining dominant patterns of internationalization, specifically as it relates to representation and relationships and resource distribution. So beyond fostering engagements across diverse critical perspectives, um, we're trying to facilitate collaboration, the sharing of information and resources and um, pedagogical modes so um, I convened this network because I know there's a lot of us doing this work under the broad umbrella of critical internationalization studies, but oftentimes we're not necessarily in conversation with one another. And I also know that a lot of us spend a lot of time sort of giving the basics of internationalization with people who are new to it, um, which is really important for us to do, but it doesn't always give us the space to have these more complex, complicated conversations that really get into the nitty gritty of how we do this work. Um, so hopefully this can be a space for both those more basic kind of engagements and, and um, resources, but also for the, the more in-depth um, examination. Um, so if you haven't visited our um, website, uh, please do so. And if you have any ideas about what the network might do or things that you think could go on the website, um, Please just let me know. I'm happy to add them, especially opportunities for publication and things like that. Um, and I'm very open to um, having those conversations. So without further ado, I will introduce our guest speaker for this session, Dr. Crystal George Mwangi. Um, and after um, Dr. George Mwangi does her um, her talk, I will open up the space for conversation. There's not so many of us here physically right now or virtually. Um, I know many more people will engage with the filmed lecture, but um, if the numbers stay pretty low, I think we can actually have a more organic conversation. If there gets to be a lot more sort of people in the room, then I might have to kind of moderate the conversation more um, so it doesn't get too chaotic. But we'll just see how it goes after um, Dr. George Wangi is done. So I will just briefly introduce her and then cede the time and the floor to her. So, um, Dr. George Mwangi is an assistant professor of higher education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Her scholarship centers on structures of opportunity and issues of inequity that impact the trajectory of diverse students into and through college. Internationalization efforts within higher education, the transnational nature of universities, and the use of higher education as a tool for international mobility and migration and African and African diaspora populations in higher education, with a specific emphasis on the impact of race, racism, and coloniality on their educational experiences. Her work has been published in Higher Education, Journal of College Student Development, Review of Higher Education, and Journal of Diversity in Higher Education. Prior to becoming faculty, she worked for a number of years as a college administrator. So we're very pleased to have you here, and the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, I appreciate you inviting me to this talk and uh, that I've titled What is a Critical Lens Doing in a Nice Field Like International Higher Education and Where Do We Go From Here? And when Sharon invited me to give this talk, I jumped at the opportunity. I said, of course I would do it. And then she asked me for a title and I thought, oh, oh no, I'm just never the witty title person. Uh, but I had just reread probably for the 10th time in my life, uh, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings article that she published in 1998 called Just What is, it, is Critical Race Theory and What's It Doing in a Nice Field Like Education? And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do a play off of that, I think for two reasons. One, because 
internationalization in higher education can oftentimes be considered depolitical or you know values neutral or treated in that way, although I, I certainly disagree. But I think that it's it's interesting to kind of have this convening and network around criticality and a critical perspective uh, being brought to it. And then I think the other reason is that the title was fitting given that back in the 90s, Ladson Billings was similarly convening scholars to consider the applicability of critical race theory, um, which originates from legal scholarship to the field of education. And I thought, you know, well, we are convening today, hopefully creating a network of support around the scholarship and work that we do. And so I thought that the title would work. Uh, but today there are four things that I would hope to do with you all. One is to describe a little bit about why and how I began engaging a critical lens in international higher education scholarship and particularly around the topic of internationalization, because that's not something that one can get from reading a journal article or, you know, book chapter that I've written quite as much. And I truly believe that one's uh, interests in research are always grounded in something. That's my paradigm, right? And so I thought I'd share a little bit about that in hopes that it in some ways can connect to you. The second thing that I'd want to do today is discuss some of the key findings from the critical discourse analysis paper that Sharon shared with the listserv in order to highlight as well as complicate where our scholarly community stands on this type of research. Uh, three, I'd like to share my own challenges and struggles related to engaging critical perspective in higher education, particularly um, global higher education, because I hope that we will continue and will be a community of support for one another. And four, I'd like to pose some thoughts and questions about where do we go from here with this work and how we as a community can continue to engage and support one another. So. That's my hope. That's a big hope for a lot of things to cover, but I'm hoping I can do it. And I my hope with posing some of those thoughts and questions, we can engage in some kind of discussion, whether it's using the chat function or, um, again, if the group remains small, if it can become interactive, um, I'm totally open to that as well. Uh, just as a caveat, I know that there are so many definitions of what a critical paradigm is, and probably even more scholarly, pedagogical, and practice-based tools to engage that paradigm. Um, and for today, I thought I would actually refer to something that's on the Critical Internationalization Studies website that was written that I thought really kind of captures some of the work that I've been doing uh, and as kind of a foundation from the for the perspective that I'm bringing today. And on the website it says, critical perspectives on internationalization have emerged that voice concerns about the risks of reproducing uneven global power relations, representations, and resource flows problematize and complicate the overwhelmingly positive and often depoliticized nature of mainstream approaches to internationalization, particularly in Western, westernized institutions, and put forth new possible approaches to international engagements, pedagogies, and forms of knowledge production. And so I think that that just encapsulates some of the types of work that I do, likely some of the types of work that you may do or are interested in. And certainly there is much more that we can discuss around what that perspective is um, as well if there are thoughts and questions around that later on. But again, like I mentioned earlier, I'd like to start a little bit about my story. And again, I believe in the power of narratives and people's stories that we invest our time and energy in our work for a purpose. And I always like to be transparent about mine. Um, there are two main factors that led me to begin engaging in scholarship related to internationalization and higher ed. Um, the first was my heritage. I grew up in what some may call a transnational family. Um, my father was born in um, the Caribbean and my mother was born here in the States um, to uh, Caribbean immigrants. And so, and I was born here in the States, um, here in the States for me being that I'm here currently in the States, you may not be. Um, but as a family, we traveled back and forth um, overseas all of the time. It was a normal part of my existence, sometimes for it to visit family, sometimes for vacation, sometimes because I was naughty and my parents were sending me off to family to handle me. Um, but for whatever reason, when I 
I was growing up, having an immigrant heritage was not unusual, although I'm racially black. But when I started engaging in higher education research um, as a graduate student, I realized that there seemed to be a disconnect between talking about race um, for people who are black and having an immigrant heritage, it was like those things just never mixed. And I thought that that was just very unusual given that so much of the black population on US college campuses are comprised of people who have an immigrant or international heritage. And so I started asking questions and wanting to, you know, really understand that particular population's experience, particularly because higher education presents so, su such a space for understanding one's identities uh, and also sometimes experiencing marginalization around one's identities. And so I've done research looking at the educational experiences of African and African diaspora populations first in the US um, and now have kind of expanded to really consider and think about how anti-Blackness can show up in, in spaces outside of the US and higher education. Um, I've done some work with um, students in the UK and hope to continue doing work in other areas as well. The other piece um, around my journey into this work was that uh, before becoming a faculty member, I worked for a number of years as a college administrator. And most of that work reflected diversity and equity work, or at least that's what it was called, multicultural affairs. And again, as a doctoral student, um, I kept seeing more and more work being done around internationalization and international, what was called international higher, but internationalization efforts. And I just thought it's really such a juxtaposition of how internationalization is discussed and the discourse around it. Um, because when we talk about multicultural affairs in our higher education spaces, it was often talking about diversity and equity. Um, and when we were talking about internationalization, it was oftentimes around, and community engagement as well. Um, with internationalization, it was around reputation building and around bringing in revenue. And there was such a different way in which the topic was talked about that I really just felt like internationalization was this elitist or hegemonic you know, thing that happened. And I really just was like, I don't, I, I, I need to know more, hopefully to be proven wrong. Um, and so I, I wanted to bring my lens of criticality to the research and to the work as well. Um, and have I been proven wrong? I think the jury's still out. Um, I don't think I fully have been, but I think there are also folks doing really great work too um, in internationalization on the ground. So it's always a mix. Um, and even today, I feel like I've circled back to that work. I'm, I'm doing a project right now that looks at um, the higher educational, the internationalization plans of a number of um, college campuses here in the US to really kind of understand the language and discourse that they use and to see, again, to ask this question I asked myself so long ago, how are discourses framed around internationalization mission? Uh, and I am finding that Although there's consistent language use around things like mutual benefit and intercultural understanding and diverse perspectives that are used to frame those strategies, there's also still most institutions using nationalistic or hegemonic or neoliberal statements to describe the, desi the desired impact of internationalization. So for example, expressing that a commitment to internationalization will make universities an investment of choice to global stakeholders, prepare their students for an incredibly globalized, connected and competitive workforce, make them a premier destination for international students and scholars. So again, um, even though so many years ago I was kind of seeing that happen it, 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 I'm still seeing that work and trying, I'm still seeing that in practice and trying to figure out uh, what does that mean and how is, how are these internationalization plans enacted. So that's just a little bit about, you know, my background and kind of what led me to the work that I do today. And um, in so many, in so many ways, and I'll continue to talk about this later, it's been interesting because I have, I've had this kind of, again, transnational heritage, have been, um, you know, I've traveled abroad, I've done some educational research abroad, but again, have been so socialized um, as a researcher through a Western paradigm 
um, and through a very US centric paradigm as well, that I, at this point in my career, I'm continuing to really figure out how to unlearn, relearn, learn new things. Um, and it's a continued struggle. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but I wanted to move on a little bit to talk about the piece, the article that Sharon shared with the listserv called Criticality in International Higher Education Research, a Critical Discourse Analysis of Higher Education Journals. Um, that study was a labor of love with, of, of myself and some students and faculty members. Uh, and last year, we were actually trying to do something similar, uh, but just at our university, to create a group that could really look at and bring a critical lens to international higher education research. And we thought, you know what, the first thing we kind of want to do is understand what is being disseminated in our field about the topic and try to bring a critical lens to that and kind of get a sense and analyze what's what's been happening. Um, and so I co-wrote that article and led that project with um, Sadaf Latifat, Shane Hammond, Susan Homers, Hani Toma, Joe Berger, and Gerardo Blanco Ramirez. And we really wanted to examine discourses that are created by higher education journals regarding internationalization within the field and to know how, you know, what are considered highly indexed or top tier top tier higher education journals present discourses on international higher education and internationalization in higher education. We wanted to know, you know what discourses related to criticality were present or absent um, because textual silences also say a lot. Uh, we wanted to know, you know how the field was being shaped and we specifically looked at highly indexed journals, not because we think that they're the most important journals, but because we know that they play a role in setting academic standards and engaging in knowledge production and dissemination. So we chose um, two US, what were called US-based higher education journals and two what were called international higher education journals and did an investigation of articles that were published there. Just again, in order to investigate whether and how what was being published were normalizing and reinforcing Western oppression and ways of knowing. Um, and we felt, and I continue to feel that without that intentionality, without that continued investigation and holding um, the field accountable, higher ed researchers and scholars and journals can fail to recognize the implicit and embedded value assessment within processes that are often deemed values neutral in the pursuit of empirical knowledge development and dissemination. And so that this critical discourse analysis was very important um, for us to engage and I'm um, very glad that higher ed decided to to publish it, even though we also critiqued their journal within it. So <laughs> um, but they they liked it anyway. So what we found um, was illuminating and also in some ways not surprising. Uh, but I think that some of the findings I just wanted to share, and if you read the article, um, that's great. I'll share a couple of things that weren't in the article as well um, that we found that we didn't have space to talk about. Um, but the first, of course, was a strong Western focus across all journals in terms of institutional affiliations of editorial boards and authors, um, and as well as geographic orientations of the article's content. So we had a feeling that most of the articles would have kind of a focus on Western um, in higher education institutions just because of our own research and what we sometimes struggle to find uh, in terms of doing literature reviews in other areas of the world. Um, but again, what wasn't surprising, but was just kind of jarring to see was that 89% of the members of the editorial boards across the journals had institutional affiliations from the US, Europe, Canada, or Australia, New Zealand. Um, and that's pretty high. Um, we know that not necessarily all of those people were from those, are those areas or countries, or that they didn't possess minoritized identities as well. So we're not suggesting that. But we also do know that the dominance of Western scholars within journal leadership has subsequent consequences for journal content as well. And so, you know, for us, that was really telling. And again, although the authorship affiliation, the institutional affiliation of journal authors or first authors is what we looked at, uh, was slightly more diverse, 
it was still off also very heavily um, Western affiliated institutions. And the juxtaposition that we also saw that I think is really important to note is that we found that authors using a more critical lens in their research were much more often to come from non-Western institutions or to be affiliated with non-Western -institu institutions than Western institutions. So that was also something I think that um, was illuminating for us. And although, you know, we see the growth of tertiary or higher education expanding across the world, we saw less than one third of articles focused on non-Western nations. Um, and, e and then we thought, you know what, we need to disaggregate this further because this East, West, whatever, it's just, you know, it's, again, there's, prob there's problems with all of the terminology, which I can talk about later, but, um, but when we disaggregated the non-Western nations, we also found that most were still what would be considered developed nations as well. Um, and so where, wh what is considered an area or region of the world um, that we are disseminating knowledge around regarding higher education is also just really interesting to see. And there's a lot of inequity there. Um, and again, it's not to say that there's nowhere in, in our scholarship where articles are being published around um, higher education institutions in other parts of the world. But these, again, are the most highly indexed journals in our field. They are the ones that people talk about as shaping the scholarship in our field, shaping the important topics in our field. And so if that is the case, then we are, we're missing some big pieces. Um, and there's a lot that's not being shared or seen. Um, Another thing that I wanted to share that I thought was interesting from that particular study was while we selected articles um, from these journals because of their focus on internationalization within higher education, we found that the majority of articles, um, authors never explicitly defined internationalization. Um, and when they did, it was oftentimes discussed as a change process that positively improved, inter that positively improved universities. Um, that was far and far and away the major the majoritarian way in which when it was defined how it was defined. Again, and this part not surprisingly probably, but that when articles did have a more critical emphasis, they also tended to illustrate internationalization as fostering potentially both positive and negative outcomes in higher ed institutions or for the communities that they serve or are um, working with or within. And so, um, you know, that ability to take kind of a holistic perspective on internationalization, again, was only really found in, 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 in research that had a critical paradigm or in, or in some ways embodied that. Um, you know, they would often critique the positive outcomes that could have, that could be had of internationalization as potential drivers of neoliberalism that could, for example, weaken the role of higher education as a public good that was talked about sometimes. So, you know, th there, there was a bit more of a balance when that critical paradigm came versus saying, you know, internationalization is just a good thing. It's a box that every university should tick off in terms of uh, initiatives and efforts on the campuses. And, you know, one reason that this much, again, higher rate of internationalization being presented as this panacea or super positive um, type of, of initiative or level of efforts um, just being presented as positive so much may be, again, because higher education um, is more of a traditional field. Yes, we say we want innovation, and yes, we talk about that, but we are a field that we are a uh, institutions of higher ed are more status quo and slow to change. And as internationalization has become more of the norm, the standard, the thing everyone has to have in a mission statement or vision statement, um, that again, we don't tend to challenge it potentially any as much anymore. Maybe it's become the new normal um, and the new thing, the thing that has positive benefits 
or is considered to have positive benefits and that we don't question. But again, scholars who bring in a critical perspective uh, kind of automatically take the time to do that initial level of investigation. Um, so there are two other major things that I wanted to share in terms of things that we found. One um, of those is that um, although education tends to be an applied field across journals, we found that implications uh, that were discussed or our recommendations often lacked a lot of specificity. And I don't think this is something specifically aligned with internationalization in higher education research. I think that it's a, a problem in education and higher education research sometimes in general. We don't spend as much time on that part of our, of our work um, at times. But um, given that, again, with articles that were more critical in nature, we didn't even really see them being as change or action oriented as we kind of had supposed. Now, it's not to say that all critical research has to say from this, this must happen and this transformation has to happen. Sometimes just creating an article is a form of resistance and getting it published and getting it into spaces and getting it getting that representation out there in and of itself is an action worthy of of making change but we did um think that while implications in a lot of articles called for social change and greater equity um, in educational systems and power structures really having an understanding of how to make that happen was lacking and we critique that only because if if a practitioner or a policymaker or anyone was to read it, it's kind of hard to know what to do with it um, sometimes. And so, you know, we thought about that. Um, how can we reimagine higher education and how can we talk about that in those types of articles? And then the last thing, um, so I've used critical perspective, articles that had a critical perspective in the study. Um, I've used that term, but I use it loosely. Um, because out of the top three frameworks for articles that we found around a, an article that we would say, you know, embodied criticality, um, the third most probably used was some type of indigenous knowledge systems type of framework. The second most used was probably, uh, was not probably was, a more post-colonial, decolonial, or anti-colonial framework. But the first most used was actually no framework at all. Um, no directly mentioned framework. Um, and that's not necessarily, I want to say it's not necessarily a bad thing. It has pros and cons. Um, it, because, because you don't have to name, a, um, you don't have to name your worldview, but, you know, at the, at, in some ways, I think as this work as critical work is meant to also advocate and I don't know I think it, and, and as for example emerging scholars are reading this the, the work it's so important I think to name things because it helps people learn more um, and it provides more exposure and so you know when we say critical perspective sometimes it was just we, we called an article an article with a critical perspective because we could see from who they were citing or how they were constructing the problem statement and their purpose statement um, that they were engaged in something that you know just deconstructed or critiqued social institutions or focused on power and oppression and equity or critiqued heteropatriarchy and neoliberalism or maybe used uh, participatory or community engaged methodologies and maybe didn't even say that but we could see that that's kind of what was going on and it made me wonder um, is it because they didn't know they were doing it and didn't have the language around it. Did they know but were, weren't wanting to take a risk in naming it? Was that a risk that one would take if one named a worldview or paradigm? What was going on? And those aren't questions that I can answer. Um, we could maybe go and contact all the authors. Maybe that study, the next study is go and contact all the authors and ask them about their thought process if they remember. Um, but it made, you know, the critical discourse analysis, that's one limitation. Nothing talks back to you. So you, you, you have what you have. But it made me wonder why so many of the 
articles that we deemed um, from our read through of it to have some lens of criticality didn't ever really name it or name a framework that would suggest it. Um, and that leads me to my own challenges and confessions around the work, um, because engaging in this, engaging in that critical discourse analysis really helped me to further process my own epistemological and ontological and even maybe methodological orientations as a scholar and how I was socialized to be a researcher. Um, as a doctoral student, I had amazing faculty who were very equity oriented, but they didn't ever really engage critical paradigms. Uh, and so I just did not have any exposure. And they didn't really do community engaged research, which is also some uh, type of research that I engage in today, but they didn't do that. I just had no exposure to it. I wrote a dissertation about African immigrant families navigating access to college in the US. And it wasn't until I was almost done, like literally in chap the last chapter, that I actually was exposed to African indigenous knowledge systems as a concept in scholarship. Um, and I think it was at a conference outside of the field of education, actually. Um, so, you know, I have really spent the, my la these last, I've been, this is my fifth year on the faculty, um, these last few years just tr trying to figure it all out. My socialization around research was incredibly Western-centric. It was incredibly, in some ways, traditional. Now, again, I don't say traditional, traditional in the fact that our field has moved towards embracing diversity and inclusion work. So it's not like it doesn't align with that movement, but I mean work that pushes beyond that boundary, that is transformational, that is justice oriented, that is equity oriented. That's not what I was socialized around as much and how to engage in that kind of work. And so I've spent this time learning and unlearning and relearning through a new lens so much. And that's a lot of work. Um, and my university probably thought that they were hiring one sort of researcher and totally have ended up with something and someone different. They're like, oh, they're probably thinking what's going on here. She's gone off the rails. It's okay. But, um, you know, I, I think that, um, the way, the way in which I understand criticality is also, again, being connected to communities and engaging with and within communities, um, again, what some are calling community-engaged research today. But again, as a faculty member, I also find that I'm not really incentivized to engage in that way. And actually, maybe I'm even de-incentivized de de to work in that way. Um, as a pre-tenure person, although I hope not for long, I just submitted my tenure dossier on September 1st, so hold Cross your fingers for me. Um, but, you know, how much risk do I take in my writing? Uh, you know, uh, when Sharon sent out the two articles, there was a second article that was attached um, when she sent to the listserv that talked about international higher education partnerships and mutuality. Um, and in that article that I wrote on my own, I used the term majority world countries as a replacement for language like developing country or global south. Um, and I got a good deal of pushback from reviewers about that language. And so for this critical discourse analysis, because I was working with the team, because we were on a time crunch, um, I didn't, we didn't use that language in that. And I, it's a regret that I, I have actually, whenever I read the article now, I kind of, I'm like, oh. I just, <laughs> I kind of say, you know, I kind of give the excuse that, well, I, we also use the language of the authors in the, in the article, but it's literally just an excuse uh, because we didn't take that extra risk, that extra step. And part of it again is because I didn't want to hold the team up. I'm on a tenure time clock. I know the review process takes a million years if it gets accepted at all, if they even want to publish this article, which is critiquing their own journal <laughs> um, to some extent. And so, you know, these are the types of considerations we engage in in critical work um, for ourselves, for the communities we work with, for the students and colleagues we work with, for the people people, institutions who wield their power over our work. Um, and learning together how to navigate that as a community is also important. And I hope something that this network will, you know, be able to hopefully provide support around. Um, because we make those small decisions, they seem small sometimes in the moment, but like I said, now every time I look at that article, I'm like, oh, I wish I would, we would have just done it. And we can't now, so it's too late. Um, so, where do we go from here? So wrapping up, um, I want us to continue to grapple with 
uh, grapple with what internationalization means today. Um, if it will continue to be a thing, the thing in higher education, how can it be reimagined? And how is it being defined by critical scholars? And how can we make space for work that is transformational and resistant? Um, in terms of where do we go from here, you know, my critical, the, not my, the critical discourse analysis that I co-wrote with other scholars um, suggests that it's important to have a seat at the table to ensure that our voices are heard when it comes to editorial boards and things like that, uh, because those are the gatekeepers of the work. Or maybe figuring out how to destroy the table altogether, I suppose. There's, also, there's always also that option. <laughs> um, but what does that mean? Does it mean to just be on the editorial boards? Does it mean starting our own journals? Does it mean providing more public support for journals who are publishing critical international higher ed scholarship because again this particular that CDA looked at just four journals this work is being published in spaces maybe it's doing some work and research around what those spaces are um, maybe it's creating an inter a, you know a critical internationalization studies syllabus you know, <laughs> um, to be able to help us engage in scholars, to know who to cite, uh, where to turn for mentorship, how to teach this work um, and engage with one another. So that might be something to think about. Um, how do we continue to hold our field accountable in order to transform what knowledge is held valuable, what regions of the world are held valuable, what issues are held valuable? Um, and again, how do we continue to figure out where to publish our work and who to cite and, you know, how to teach our courses in ways that align with this worldview, particularly like me when we weren't taught it ourselves, when we weren't, we, when we weren't educated about this ourselves. I'm hoping this network can provide support around this. Um, and I know that some of you are doing some of this great work. And so how can we share, and have been doing, some of you for doing it for a long time, longer than I have. So how can we share that. Um, so lastly, you know, just to circle back, I always like to circle back. So circling back to Ladson Billings article, just what is critical race theory and what's it doing in a nice field like education. Ladson Billings at the very end of the article provided some words of caution. And I think that that's also fitting and asking where do we go from here and things to kind of consider because Ladson Billings talked about at the time in the 90s her fear that critical race theory, if it started being applied to education, would become just another watered down buzzword in education scholarship. Well, what, 20 years later now? <laughs> um, I would argue that I've definitely seen that happen. You know, when we think about terms like intersectionality, it's like everyone's throwing that word around all the time. An NSF program officer said it to me and I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, um, you know, so uh, what, what happens if and when the continued lens that we're using becomes used more? And how do we as a network um, help to have voice in that? I think that exposure and representation of the work is important, but I do also heed lots and Billings warning um, because again, internationalization in itself, in my opinion, has become that box to check off by universities to demonstrate a certain type of reputation or status. Our eyes begin to gloss over when we see the word. It's easy to feel like it's empty. Um, and at the same time, that word, that concept, those initiatives can be incredibly dangerous and consequential to so many if we don't take the time to understand what is behind the initiatives that are happening. So, you know, what does further support advocacy for teaching and learning of criticality and its application to internationalization kind of mean the same fate over time? I don't know, but I know Glad Gloria Ladson Billing said we should think about it, so I'm throwing it out there to you all because I respect her opinion. So that's all that I have for today. I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen to me, and I'll turn it back over to Sharon, I guess, for further discussion or however we want to, or question and answer however you want to do it.